Hello, and welcome back. We are talking about section 7.3 today, optimizing functions of two variables. Specifically, today we're going to try to tackle sort of the first half of this first learning objective. Uh, we're going to locate relative extrema for a function of two variables, um, and then the classify piece is going to wait. So, relative extrema. So this particular term ought to sound familiar to you if you've done your uh, optimization with functions of one variable uh, and the principle is basically the same for functions of two variables so relative extrema so so this is the the plural uh, the singular we write with uh, just like lots of Latin things extremum means one and this means extrema means more than one so and this is also just a fancy word for uh, max or min and Right, like most math terminology, we're trying to be efficient with this and saying, oh, it could be either, so we'll come up with one word to mean the situation where we either come up with a maximum or a minimum. So in any event, function f of x, y is said to have a relative maximum, so there's the one scenario at some point, if basically its outputs are as big or bigger um, than any of the outputs in a little area around it. So a circular disk is kind of, you know, circles tend to be the... The, the canonical shape for distance here because it's the circle has a fixed distance from its center point um, so we're just saying basically since our domain in the case of a function of two variables is a little more complicated it's not just an interval uh, or, or union of intervals of real numbers it's a thing out in a plane uh, then what we want is basically a little little disk a little filled in circle around this spot um, in which that point is the sort of king of the hill if you will uh, and actually that analogy kind of holds physically when we look at these surfaces. Uh, and then the other case is a relative minimum, and that's the other scenario where if you're at that point, C comma D in the XY plane, uh, it is the smallest or at least tied for smallest with all the points in its, in its little area. So I always find I'm a fairly visual learner, so I like to have some pictures to go along with this. So one uh, Wolfram Alpha generated image we can go with would be this is a, a chunk of this this figure. Again, this uses kind of the, the wireframe, the box uh, structure for, for setting up these 3D figures. So I'm sort of imagining that I've uh, brought down these very sharp walls that have kind of cut off the rest of the, the surface from, from uh, what's depicted here. So we're just seeing uh, a, a, th a thin slice of basically this entire picture. But it's the slice that happens to have the point they're interested in, which is the relative maximum. It's somewhere around here. We could use technology if we had the actual formula in front of us, but the claim here is that this maximum uh, has a height of about uh, 0.5. And again, we can kind of trace along here. So here's the z-axis, the actual output uh, um, axis upon which the outputs are tracked. And so uh, half the distance between uh, these guys would be negative a half and then zero. And then it looks like 0.5 is basically the top of this box, which is essentially where that brightest white uh, shade is. And that's kind of what Wolfram Alpha does is it, it, it um, shades things brighter when it's higher in the figure and shades things darker when it's lower. And so that's the actual output. Uh, so if I was writing my little triples here, then 0.5 would be the, the Z coordinate. That is not a five, Mike. Get your stuff together here, boy. Okay, so, uh, and then the, the claim is the location is at about 0.6. So that's our first coordinate is X going lexicographically, assuming that since X comes before Y in the alphabet, its point is also coming first. So then we'd have, and what I'm gonna to try to do is basically draw a dotted line that's parallel to this one, because we're going for that, that sort of perspective here where, um, and this is sort of going behind the figure, if you will. Uh, so this is a very <laughs> poor illustration of what x equals 0.6 would look like. Um, and that's along basically the bottom of this box. And then the y value that goes along with that, the claim is that it's zero. So essentially it's, it's uh, the y-axis is this one that's kind of imagining going back into your screen uh, and halfway back is the, the point zero. So again, I'm gonna to try to, this is my y-axis, so I'm gonna to try to draw a dotted line that's basically parallel to that. Again, it kind of dips under the figure here. I'm imagining it it, uh, it would be obscured by this part of the surface. And then, you know, again, imperfect, but going straight up to get to this point, we would get to roughly where that the claim is that relative maximum would be. 
So identifying from a picture, great. Uh, I can see it, it is roughly, and the claim is that it's at 0.6 for an x value and zero for a y value and 0.5 for the height. I guess if this were a true false question, you could say, yeah, basically. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of human error just in guessing with uh, a graph. But it is nice to have that visual perspective on this. So <laughs> visual perspective is all well and good, but a lot of what we do has to come from formulas because that's, that's how math classes roll. Um, so we're going to give ourselves a, a more formal definition for this, not just where a bump or a graph is, but something that actually helps us go out and find this given a formula. So the critical point, if you recall critical points for functions of one variable, were basically either a point where f prime of this fun uh, f prime for this function f was either equal to zero or it was undefined. Um, but still in the domain of f. So basically the same thing, the analogous thing happens in this case. Well, except that we've got two derivatives that we could be taking. Instead of just saying f prime, that's not good enough anymore because we've got two input variables. We say we want both f sub x, that is the derivative of this function in the x direction to be zero. We also want the derivative of this function in the y direction to be zero. Um, and uh, so we say that these are the only places where a critical points can occur. Now, the same caveat applies. If f sub x or f sub y was undefined, then we'd also have uh, places where this could happen. But uh, because we're already getting more complicated than the one dimensional case, we tend to ignore the, the undefined side of this critical point condition. But if it is true that both these derivatives are zero, just to go back a second to this previous slide, uh, basically what we're saying is, if you're at this peak and you start looking in the x direction, for instance, um, uh, sorry, I'm looking in the y direction, we'll do y first. So if we fix x, so that is x is some constant and we only move in the y direction, we're imagining that the slope at that spot ought to be zero. That is, we are going perfectly uh, horizontal right at that, that point. And the same thing ought to be true in the x direction. So if we fix our x, and uh, if we fix our y and only go in the x direction, then the claim is if we're at that top spot there, then f sub x would also be zero. Um, I've made some poor placement choices here. Uh, so in any event, that's, that's the claim from this, this definition, that both of those derivatives ought to be zero if we are at a max or a min. But as you may recall, it doesn't, this does by itself doesn't tell us whether it's a max or a min, or it might not be either. But let's get practice just finding critical points with some kind of random function out there to begin with. So here's our function xy plus 4 over x plus 2 over y. And uh, our strat all we have to do is find critical points, so at least, at least that's nice. Our first strategy uh, is just based off of this definition. It says critical points happen where f sub x is 0 and where f sub y is equal to 0. So starting from this formula again. Uh, and just a reminder there again, so here's our function, and then uh, f sub x would mean take the derivative of this thing, so because they're separated by addition, we can deal with each of these three terms individually, which is nice. So derivative of this guy with respect to x, uh, this is the one that always trips people up, uh, so y is a constant in this perspective, y is not being allowed to change, only x is, so if we had x times, I'm going to picture in my head this is like x times 5, pick your favorite number for whatever the y would be, x times 5, the derivative of that would just be 5, so x times y, the derivative of that is just y when x gets to change. Um, this thing is really 4x to the negative 1. We could do quotient rule on it, but that seems like overkill, kind of bazooka on a mosquito sort of situation. Um, so if we if we switch it to this form, then all we have to do is power rule. It does have an x in it, which is great, with some derivative with respect to x. So the 1 comes down, we get a negative sign, the power goes down by 1, so we're at x to the negative 2. Same deal, 4 over x squared is the same thing. And then before we get carried away with this one, we could certainly write this as 2 times y to the negative 1 as well. But this term doesn't have any x's in it. So as far as the x is concerned, this is 0. So you could, you could put a big old plus 0 on that if you'd like, just to make yourself feel better. But it's still 0. Now we have the other side of this, f sub y. So exact same starting function. We go back to this original thing. And now we take all derivatives with respect to y. So this first term, now the y gets changed and the x does not. So now the only thing that makes it out of that is x. <laughs> uh, again, I'm picturing x as some number, let's say 3, why not? 3 times y, the derivative of that would just be 3. 
So if it's x times y, the only thing that survives that is x. Uh, our middle term for x to the negative 1 is beautiful, but it has no y's in it, so this is a plus 0 in the middle, if you'd like. And then our final term has 2y to the negative 1. We finally get to make use of that here, because its derivative, then it, has, it actually has a y in it, so that's the most important piece. And so we get to do a power rule, the negative 1 comes down, so we got a minus, it's 2. And then since the power went down to negative 2, we could write that as y, uh, y squared in the bottom. And then remember what we're supposed to do with these two calculations, as fun as they are, there's more to do, we're supposed to take each and set them equal to zero. So we do that through the magic of algebra. Uh, we can imagine adding this uh, 4x squared thing over, getting these guys on opposite sides of the equation, and we end up with y equals stuff. Um, basically the same story here, so we could imagine adding this term over. Same thing happens, x equals that. And it's worth remembering that what we have going on here is actually a simultaneous system of equations. So this y is the same as that y, and this x is the same as that x, which is not always true just looking at two different equations like this. So we are treating these as the same uh, unknown values that we're trying to solve for, which means that if we have these things written in this fashion, we should be able to say, oh look, this is a y, that's a y, so wherever we see y, we'd be just as correct substituting in 4x squared. Boop. Don't forget to square that whole deal. Um, what that means is this equation, this system of equations, becomes a single equation. So this side is still x, it's still 2 over, and then here's where y used to be. Now it's written in terms of, of this x thing. Now, why in the name of, of all things good would we want to do this? Uh, it looks like we've just made things more complicated. It has in the short run, but now we have a single equation with one variable. That's a really good scenario for us. Uh, two equations with two variables, really their, their best hope in life is to turn into a single equation with one variable. Um, you know, simple, simple goals in life. So let's take that and run with it. So uh, our simplified version, remember this was uh, 4 squared, so there's 16. It was x squared squared, so that's x to the fourth. And then doing, again, some more exciting algebra. Uh, this is x to the negative 3. We're going to get one of these guys to peel off, basically. Uh, but otherwise, it's x to the negative 4, if we think of this as written in the numerator. So that x cubed gets dumped over on the right side. There's all kinds of ways you could do this. This is just one strategy. We divide the 2 off, uh, and then cube root. So if we divide 2 off, 16 over 2 is 8, and then cube root of 8 is a nice tidy 2. So we have a, a, a nice round number for our x. We're still not quite done yet, because remember, in order to have a, an actual critical point, it's really going to be an actual honest-to-goodness point, an x comma y. So we found the x thing. It turns out it doesn't matter where we go to get this other y, uh, as long as we go to one of the original equations. And so I'll pick the one that's already solved for y, because that's the thing we're trying to get anyway, right? So if we take this 2 and dump it in for x, we're going to get 4 over 2 squared. 4 over 4 is 1. So for a grand total of, uh, again, this was our x that we found, and this was our y. So this is the location of the only possible place where a relative extremum could be. So the fact that this is a critical point, it turns out, is really just a stepping stone for us. Um, because primarily, this does not tell us whether it's a maximum or a minimum. And really, it might not be either of these things. So we're also going to develop a, a means, an algebraic means, a, a means using a formula to figure out, hey, if this is a critical point, how can I tell if this actually corresponds to a maximum for this function, a relative minimum, or, or maybe neither of those things? We can use the visual sort of appeal. <laughs> we can check this out. So if we look at the graph of that original f of x, y thing, that what was it, x, y plus 4 over x plus 2 over y, something like that, then its graph has something like this, again, generated, thank, thank you, Wolfram Alpha. Um, but uh, this point 2 comma 1, so an x value of 2 is basically right in the middle of this box. Uh, a y value of 1 is, is part way back. And so it's at least vaguely convincing that this point, sort of this, I'm picturing a, a sheet kind of being held at the edges, um, where the sheet kind of drapes down in the middle, that it's at least plausible that 2 comma 1 
uh, would be the location of a relative minimum for this function. But we'll come back in the next video to talk about a test to make sure that our intuition is actually correct.